Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 376. High blood pressure, what it means, and how to help your doctor help you. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Just recently, the, uh, a dozen different medical societies around the world have come together and agreed that the current diagnosis levels of stage one hypertension that we've all grown up with and, and have been used to for the last 30 years uh, of a blood pressure higher than 140 over 90, 90. 90 needs to be medicated, that that's a sign of mm-hmm. hypertension, stage one hypertension, and that between 1, 20, 30 over 80 to 90, you are pre-hypertensive. <laughs> and, and I can remember being told when I was in my early 30s, okay, you're pre-hypertensive. We need to watch your blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Nobody said anything about going on medicine, but they said, you got to watch your weight. You got to watch your salt intake. You got to watch your caffeine intake. You know, you need to not let this creep up, do these things to remain healthy. Uh, I don't know that that was useful information to me, that there were applicable things that I was given to do. I was just warned. But that you were warned of something, hypertension, but you weren't warned of what hypertension could then lead to. Not that really, That hypertension no. really was a precursor to many diseases like heart disease and stroke. And, um, and diabetes has a lot to do with weight gain. So it usually goes along with diabetes. Yeah. It's not necessarily a causative thing. So, so suddenly we have this perfect storm uh, in all the industrialized nations mm-hmm. of the world because all these medical societies are in these industrialized because nations. we don't exercise as much and we don't eat properly. We're getting obese yeah. because our diets contain so much sugar mm-hmm. uh, and we eat too many prepared foods, processed foods. Mm-hmm. I, I can remember I've been going to France pretty regularly over the last 30 years. And when I first went there, Mm -hmm. uh, they ate almost no prepared foods. They went to the grocery store once a day. Mm -hmm. They bought the the food for the meal they planned. Mm -hmm. And then dinner was uh, an evening's entertainment and visiting. And they only needed refrigerators this big. They had small refrigerators. Mm -hmm. I I mean, all that, but they made fresh food. Mm -hmm. Now, over the 30-year period, they've become more Americanized. And they they have these these big grocery stores with, instead of local community markets Mm -hmm. or specialty markets, they have these massive grocery stores, Carrefour, which is like going to a Sam's or a Walmart and buying all these prepared foods because their schedules have accelerated. Now they're like Americans and they have just a few minutes to fix dinner that or heat up a can of something mm-hmm. before they have to take their children to ball games or activities. <laughs> activities. And, and so and now, both people work now. So there isn't someone home taking working. care of everything. Yeah. So, there are cultural shifts, but, but so now so it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's, we brought our culture to every, 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 uh, um, Industrialized, industrialized society. Yeah. Nation. So, so there are uh, <laughs> overwhelming amounts of obesity, uh, diabetes in industrialized nations because of these food and, and food and scheduling activity issues. basically is yeah. the problem. But so so now they can't fix that part. So we fix something well, else. Well, uh, yeah, you know, un- untangle the, it's a Gordian knot. How do you untie the knot? Right. So they're trying to cut the knot and say, we have to drop the hypertensive diagnostic load or level Mm -hmm. to 120 over 80. If your blood pressure gets above 120 Mm -hmm. over 80, uh, systolic, diastolic, Mm -hmm. then we need to put you on medicine because that's stage one hypertensive now. They don't put, not not 120 over, they don't put you on medicine at until Until you get to the old stage one. We put you on medicine at the same time we always did, 140 over 90. But now we're warning you which is a good thing. We're warning you and trying to prevent the, um, the progress to these other deadly diseases by saying, before you get to 140 over 90, you have high blood pressure and that high and high blood pressure is going to lead to medicine for high blood pressure when it gets worse. So they're trying to be preventive and give you a warning so that you will 
eat properly, not eat as much salt, not eat as much fat, lose weight, and exercise okay, eat daily. Caffeine, eat proper foods. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Dr. Paul K. Welton, who is the lead author of the new guidelines, mm -hmm. is quoted as saying, we want to be straight with people. If you already have a doubling of risk, you need to know about it. It doesn't mean that you need medication, but it's a yellow light that you need to be lowering your blood pressure, mainly with non-drug approaches. So they don't want to put you on medicine. They want you to, to so it hasn't really changed that are somewhat <laughs> under your control mm -hmm. to modify your lifestyle and, and your uh, exercise and eating patterns and so on. Well, to me, you know, we do preventive medicine. Right. That's part of what we do with hormone replacement and changing diet and exercise and, and, th and giving supplements so that patients don't get sick in the future. So this is an example, a good example of hopefully the future of medicine is Preventive medicine. So we're trying to prevent hypertension from actually coming to a point where we need medicine. Right. But hypertension is really a condition that is a precursor to diseases. In itself, hypertension doesn't usually cause, it is, isn't something that's going to give you symptoms. It's not something that you're going to feel. But in time, over time, it causes heart disease, stroke, and um, and those are the things that kill us. Kidney and, damage. Yeah, kid, excuse me, kidney damage as well. Uh, so, so, so can you take a minute to explain? What, uh, you have the systolic and diastolic, mm -hmm. and one is the force of the pump, and one is the relaxed amount of pressure in the blood vessels. Right. And you talk about when when somebody says, "Well, you're hypertensive," or "You're mm -hmm. prehypertensive." As a layman, I don't really know what that means. But uh, it sounds interesting. Well, it's a so. So what was so it? So if you look at it, if you look at some, if you have to kind of think of anything that you could think of with with liquids and a tube, basically pushing liquids through a tube, like a so, clogged toilet, like a clogged toilet. <laughs> yeah. So so if we have so if our heart is um, every day is pushing blood through our blood vessels and and when we're healthy, the blood vessels will will expand and contract, and they will be able to take the large amount of blood during systole, which is the contraction of the heart. It pushes the blood, so it'll be able to uh, expand and then and push the blood along easily. The strength of the pump. The strength of the pump. And then when the uh, valves close and the heart is, is filling back up so it can push blood out to the heart, to the body again, then that is diastole. That's when they say the heart's relaxed. It's really, it's relaxed because it's filling from the other side. Then when it's, it's in systole, so, so it's the heart pushing like a blood into the body. Reservoir. Right. And the, the blood that's circulated through your body co comes back into the heart mm -hmm. when it's resting. The after, after it's gone to your lungs and gotten all the oxygen again, it's gone from your veins to, to your heart, to your lungs. And back to the left side of your heart. When it goes to the left side of your so heart. So it comes in this side, then that valve shuts. And right. this one opens. And, it and the muscle it out, spasms and pushes, pumps. Well, it contracts. Spasms sounds awful. like, <laughs> But it's, it's, a, it's a controlled contraction. A con right. And so it pushes the blood out to your body. So what that requires of the vessels is for them to be elastic, be able to expand and contract, for them to be supple. And not stiff. So they have to flex as the blood right. tries to go through them. Right. So you. So that's what that that kind of requires the blood to to be pushed along these nice supple vessels, which is what we have when we're young. Right. But as we age and we eat the wrong things and we don't exercise and and we get obese, our vessels become stiffer and they become lined with fat. And so then it's like put the heart has a harder job of pushing the blood through these hard, stiff vessels. There's no elasticity to them. Yes. So as the heart is pushing, it has a hard, it has a harder job. So what I liken it to is if you're trying to uh, use a plunger to get a, a clog out of your drain, you're having to put, put a lot of force pressure. behind it. Yeah. So c consider your heart's doing that all the time if you have plaque and if you have stiff vessels. So basically... If when the clog goes, you don't have to push as hard, right? So, so plaque is, so, is a, a name for a buildup of stuff inside your blood vessels, right? It, it, it coats your blood vessels and it makes makes the uh, vessel smaller or narrower. 
So it's it's harder to push fluid through a narrow tube than it is to push fluid through a large so tube. I saw a video years ago of a Dr. Michael DeBakey from South mm-hmm. Africa mm-hmm. who was doing a heart surgery. Mm-hmm. And he cut this guy's artery and, and pulled it up and was showing people it was like just yellow goo and a, and a little right. trickle of blood. Right. Then he took a pair of forceps and he, he started yeah. pulling on the goo. And he pulled out like a two-foot plug of mm-hmm. just almost like fat looking mm-hmm. stuff and when he it when it cleared that mm-hmm. uh, six or eight inches of whatever it was then like blood spurted all the way across exactly the room. exactly he just he just cleared the clog yeah so he was showing who's a plumber yeah he was he was a very sophisticated and brilliant plumber yeah but that's pretty much what cardiac surgeons are yeah but that, i mean it was amazing the difference in the flow and force mm-hmm. of the blood once they had removed the blockage and the blockage is the plaque Build up. Mm-hmm. Plaque buildup that happens. That's what causes hypertension is plaque buildup and stiffening of the arteries. Now, you can have stiffening of the arteries without plaque, like smokers have a lot of stiffening of the arteries because they it it causes that. The hypoxia in your body when you're smoking cigarettes causes you to have low oxygen levels and your vessels respond by becoming stiff. So you can have it with that you can have a stiff vessel so without hard if they don't get enough oxygen. Right. They get hard over okay. time. I mean, it's not yeah. like if you smoke one cigarette, they're going to get hard. But if you do that for, for a year or more, then they're going to start responding to that. Your body has ways of trying to adapt to the bad environment we give it. You know, yeah. so, so you here we it, have. It tries to protect itself. Right. So hypertension is a, is a result of years of bad diet, exercise, bad, no exercise and, uh, smoking, drinking too much. I mean, there's many factors, but, but this is a long-term buildup. So what they're trying to do with this new level is say, if you're just almost like, if you're not low blood pressure, basically, Mm -hmm. then you need to start looking at all of these factors in your life so that you don't get high blood pressure. That's preventively. So you don't get Heart disease. So a month and a half ago, when they changed these numbers mm-hmm. as the standard, mm-hmm. by definition, then they moved 46% of the adult American population into the hypertensive category. But not the hypertensive the pre-hypertensive. treated. The pre-hypertensive. The pre-hypertensive, yeah. not well, the treated, treated category. With diet and exercise. And not treated with medicine. Right, not treated with medicine. So the medicine part of it didn't change. Didn't change. And that's it's, important to hear. And yes. Recognize. So not, you don't need, because you're 120 over um, 80, you don't need medicine or over that. Yeah, it's like these signs, a, a work area on the highway where they put up a sign saying, if you hit a worker, you're going to get a $10,000 fine and 10 years in jail. You know, you need to know bad things are going to happen. This is a warning sign. If and it's a, take- it's a warning sign yes. that we would like people to think about because we want you to prevent heart disease. We do that in, in our practice by putting people on diets, exercise programs, supplements, and bioidentical hormones if they have gotten to the point in their life where they're not making those hormones because that's also preventative for heart disease and uh, and obesity, diabetes, many of the things that uh, kill us in our industrialized societies. So there are things, I mean, we're talking about just by definition, they've moved a whole mass of population in, into these categories of risk. Mm-hmm. But some of those risk categories are not driven by lifestyle. They're driven right. by genetics or they're right. driven by some other There are issues. some risks, like like for anything, there are some risks that you can't change. As of today, we can't change our genetics. So if you have a family history of everyone having hypertension, then you're already at risk because of that. If you're 30, you're not as you're not in imminent danger. But if you're 60 and you don't have hypertension, you have a high high chance of becoming hypertensive because of your family history. Kind of a Darwinian so, approach. Yes, it is Darwinian. <laughs> but uh, but even the fact that, so, so that's genetics. Another thing you can't change is your age. You know, we're lucky if we get older, but as we get older, we get more things and we accumulate more of the, um, of, uh, of the uh, outcomes of our bad habits. Yes. So, Aging increases the risk of hypertension. You collect more of that stuff, or you've, or you have sat sat in a chair for too long, or because you're old, older, then your body isn't as fresh and alert and vibrant as it was, mm-hmm. and so things that you used to naturally have, like nitric oxide, may mm-hmm. diminish right. as a, as a function of aging. Right. So nitric oxide is is a um, 
secretion of the of the blood vessels, but that it's secreted in a lot of other areas in your body. But nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So if your blood vessels aren't so stiff that they can't dilate, then then it will help them it will help them dilate so that the heart doesn't have such a hard job of pushing blood through the vessels. So nitric oxide is also what we give you when we give you Viagra. Nitric oxide is what is stimulated by Viagra. It causes you to have vasodilation or dilation of the blood vessels in your pelvis so you can have an erection. So that is another thing that nitric oxide does. Mm -hmm. So that's something that comes with age, that we lose that. We have we have ability with some um, supplements called Neo, one supplement called Neo Forty that actually does work at giving you back the nitric oxide. So it helps with erections, but it also helps with the plasticity or the uh, the ability of, of elasticity of your blood vessels, which then drops your blood pressure. Well, let's talk about erections for a minute, because for men in particular, as they age, that begins to be a measure of their own perceived health right. if they can get an erection mm -hmm. and and use it in the way that mm -hmm. they're used to using it or if they start to have trouble with doing that mm -hmm. then that certainly gets their attention and they say well i've got a concern mm -hmm. and they'll go to the doctor and they say i'm having trouble with this mm -hmm. is there a medicine that you can give me for this and it's called ed or erectile dysfunction mm -hmm. and a lot of doctors will give you a prescription if you go in and complain about mm -hmm. that we have learned talking about preventative mm -hmm. medicine we've learned that Men in their 50s who start to have erectile dysfunction concerns very often, not always, but very often that is like a five-year early warning uh, signal Sorry. that you're going to have cardiovascular stroke-related risk. Or heart, heart, heart attack. Heart attack-related problems. Exactly. Now, not always, though, and that's where the, the Neo 40 and other things kind of mm -hmm. come in. Uh, you have to determine if the ED issues that you are having are caused because you have cardiovascular problems mm -hmm. or if they're caused for some secondary reason. So which is why you need to go to a doctor that can do the test. So we have a lot of patients, a lot of men come to us who have low testosterone and ED. Mm -hmm. And both occurred about the same time. Late forties, early fifties. And so so we we go about this by they usually have been already checked out by their doctor. If they have hypertension, they're already treated. So we give them not just Viagra, but we give them testosterone in pellet form, which is very good at increasing your own nitric oxide, both men and women's, but nitric oxide is much more obvious in men when, because it helps with their erections. So we see some men with testosterone who do great. They, they don't need anything and else. And they often don't need the Viagra they anymore. They don't need the Viagra anymore. In, in part, because in, the paradox of this for men, and I know this wasn't where we started our conversation, but... <laughs> but it's a, something a, everybody likes to do. A lot of the men that go on ED medicines do it because they're not as sexually satisfied as they once were, mm -hmm. or their fear of not being able to satisfy their partner or in the way that they, they just once want to perform. were able. <laughs> the performance anxieties. Mm -hmm. But... It, that's in part because their testosterone is low. Mm -hmm. And when you when you replace the testosterone, then the libido grows, the oxytocin gets better, mm -hmm. uh, and the erections get better if those are the issues that are causing the problem. If it's, yes, if so, it's so just testosterone. It's, it's kind of a multiple choice issue. It's a warning sign. You're mm -hmm. not getting the erections you wanted to have or that you're used to having. Then that's an indication that something isn't working right. But mm -hmm. it could be testosterone. It could be the loss of libido. Right. You get that restored, all things are good. But most men know whether they want to have sex or if they can't perform, and they yes. know that that's a different thing. And they don't know what to do. And about they it. and they don't know what to do about it. So so what we so that's one of the things that is a it, it is related to high blood pressure. If they have high blood pressure, and they're on medication, we usually try to get them on a, um, a high blood pressure medication that doesn't make. ED worse, right. but the sign that they have high blood pressure and ED is a sign that possibly testosterone alone isn't going to help right? because they've already got vascular stiffening and, uh, and loss of elasticity. So they've already got a problem with dilating their blood vessels and maybe testosterone won't be enough. And supplements like Neo 40, you have to get them, uh, recommended you get them from physician, but, mm -hmm. but they're not prescription medicine. No, they're not, but they're, they're through physicians. Through physicians. So, okay, so, so we were talking about risk factors that can't be changed. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the risk that you're going to be hypertensive because of your genetics. Mm -hmm. Race is also a, a yeah. concern. 
race it is uh well race is genetics but so <laughs> yes, but obviously yeah but it is but but unfortunately african americans have a much higher rate of high blood pressure and all of the diseases that follow which increases mortality so if you're african american it is much more important that you treat your blood pressure and don't don't avoid taking the medicine for it because that that puts you at higher risk, especially if you're starting to get older. That, and this that is true for males and risk. females. Males and females. Yes. You should take your high blood pressure medicine. It's very important. It's important for everyone, but it's a, there's a higher risk that at an earlier age that you will uh, that African Americans will have problems with this and the diseases that follow. So so. Hispanics and, and Caucasians aren't necessarily American at the same Hispanics, degree of risk. American Caucasians aren't necessarily at the same risk. They're, in fact, they're at a lower risk. But that doesn't mean you don't take your medicine. <laughs> okay, so what we've been discussing is a change in awareness and uh, focus intent about th the basic levels of blood pressure, or the, the definition or qualification of hypertensive mm -hmm. uh, experience, pre-hypertension, hypertension that requires uh, a medical intervention, stage one hypertension. And some of those realities are things that we can't avoid, like aging or genetics or race. Some of them you can avoid. And we're going to come back next week in our next health cast and talk about things that you can do to make interventions in a timely fashion for your own quality of life and health that can help you avoid a hypertensive crisis in your life. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.